Hey everybody, how's it going? Hey guys, morning. Um, still morning. Yeah, still morning. My name is uh, Dave Rodman. I'm the managing partner at the Rodman Law Group. Um, this is Ben Lakoff. Uh, we're doing a little bit of a fireside chat today. Well, Ben Lakoff, founder of Charge Particles, uh, founder of Bankless Ventures. Yeah, Ben Lakoff, founder of Charge Particles, been around in the space for a while, uh, recently launching Bankless Ventures, which is an early stage Web3 fund, part of the Bankless Media. So this, this, uh, this talk was uh, titled Navigating Web3 Safely and Successfully, and the idea was I would talk about the safely, Ben would talk about the successfully, we ended up having less time than we uh, planned, so I think we're going to focus more on the safely, which is the legal side. Um, but uh, please come to Ben's talk on, what is it, Friday? Yeah, Friday. Friday, uh, to hear more about raising and just being a successful founder. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's start off. It's kind of difficult to see, but um, of, of the people out here, how, how many people are founders? A couple. Um, how many are, are first-time founders in the Web3 space? Nice. And then um, how many people are working on a startup actively and thinking about fundraising for said startup? Okay, cool. Um, so I think where we probably want to start is like mistakes that founders make jumping into the market right away. So. Dave, you're counsel for a number of startups in the space, mentor at a number of accelerators, like early stage startups. Uh, let's start off with a broad one of like, what's the most common mistake or misconception you see by founders jumping into the Web3 space and starting to operate? Yeah, uh, so I think the number one uh, misconception is that you can move fast and break stuff the same way that you could in other traditional Web2 software development companies, Facebook, Uber. Um, yes, they faced some regulation along the way and they paid some fines, but the thing about Web3 is that it is inherently financial. I mean, it, it, whether you want it to be or not, it has this financial component to it, which means from like day one, you are operating in one of the most stringent regulated industries in this country. And the federal government has some real opinions on um, who can do these things, how these things are done, and what you cannot do. And the mentality of moving fast and breaking stuff, we'll deal with it later, just doesn't work. The statute of limitations on a lot of these violations are like 14 years long. We're all working on an immutable ledger. Like, there are things that you can do right away that seem tiny that can absolutely fuck you up many years later. Um, <clears throat> I think, I mean, I'm wearing a Tornado Cash shirt. I wear them at all my, my talks now. This is a great example. I mean, I, we firmly do not believe in what has happened to, to Tornado Cash, but founder's in jail right now uh, because FinCEN and um, money laundering, uh, you know, not that I think that's what was happening as its main purpose, those are very scary laws that you do not want to violate. And you can end up in Guantanamo Bay like that under the Patriot Act. So uh, that's that's... I think a long way of answering the question that you just asked me. Yeah, no, and I, so for context, uh, Dave's one of my best friends, also my lawyer, also lawyer for many of the companies I invest in or involved with. But um, oh, you know what? Yeah, none of this is legal oh, advice. Yeah. This is all or financial advice from Ben. Uh, this is all uh, educational, and uh, you should definitely talk to a lawyer. Yeah, so that that, but that's a, a perfect example. He's he's scared the shit out of me with all of this stuff. Um, so I think you should have like a healthy bit of fear, but and maybe we dive into that. It, it's not so much that you shouldn't shouldn't uh, operate in the space. You just have to know like what sort of levels of risk you're taking by the actions that you're doing and kind of the jurisdictions that you're playing in and what their uh, prerogative is. But um, you know, so a lot of those things that you were talking about is scary. What's happened with Tornado Cash uh, devs is certainly scary. So some founders I hear are like you know. Well, we'll be a DAO. We'll operate as a nons. We'll just not have a legal entity and 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 do it like that. Um, talk to me about that approach and kind of what you would talk to somebody that has that approach to going about this. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's one anon, and that's Satoshi. 
Uh, he had no team that we know of. Uh, he was an individual actor at a time when no one knew what this stuff was because it didn't exist. That's like, and it, it was, and it was probably Hal Finney who died. Let's just be honest. Uh, so the there's never going to be another time where someone can be truly anon because you need to have a team. You could have, you could personally have the best opsec in the world and cover your tracks 100%. But you probably got to raise capital. Probably got to employ somebody. Like there's, there are now like gaps in the armor, and you cannot rely on anonymity or pseudonymity to protect you. Like the government is looking for these projects. They are looking to get you. And if you think I'm being, if you, I think I'm being uh, like overly cautious here. Gary Gensler is actively coming to get you if you're in this space. He's coming after stable coins. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Jesus Christ. He, he, in, his, in his article the other day, he talked about, oh, well, if you create a foundation offshore, we don't care. I mean, like, that's what everybody does. That's like our go-to thing. Like, he can't just say that and be accurate. Like, he, he's, he's actually not speaking truth about the law. But you can see his mentality. He's the number one regulator of this stuff in this country. He is after you. Full okay. stop. Okay, so being anon, probably very difficult to do in practice, but what about just setting up a DAO um, and, and launching it from a DAO, from a decentralized autonomous organization? Sure, so like that's sort of an, another common one we get when people come to the firm and, and ask us, uh, you know, I, I want to do this thing. It's kind of sketchy. From a regulatory standpoint, well, I'm just going to DAO it and I'll be fine. No, you're not going to be fine. Um, first of all, an entity list DAO raises all sorts of insane issues with everything from 100% personal liability for all actions of said DAO uh, to um, really, really weird uh, tax uh, issues. Now, so let's just say that everybody in this audience, we all form a DAO together, and half of us are anon or pseudo-anon, and half of us are disclosed, and I'm a partner at a law firm in Denver, and I'm a member. If this DAO does something and there is a damage a plaintiff's attorney can sue me, Dave Rodman, personally for the entire damage. And it's on me to try to recover from all of the unknown people who I might not even know the real, their real names. They might be in Asia. They might be in the Ukraine. Uh, they could be down the street, and I would never know that. Um, so you know, any of the exposed members of that are 100% liable. Um, and that's just civil liability. Um, then you, know, you have examples like I was talking about these risks for years, and then the Uki Dao uh, uh, suit happened. I mean, like that was terrible, but it was validation of all the things that I've been saying. So then the immediate next thing is the client says, "All right, well, we'll just throw an LLC around it, and call it good." No, you can't do that. You throw an LLC around it, and you have more than 500 people in it, and you have more than 10 million dollars of assets. You have the same reporting requirements as Facebook, as Apple as Microsoft, you have to report to the SEC. And are you going to do that? No. Are you able to do that? No. Uh, so you have these caps of participants. And that, that's just like if that DAO was meant to do like build widgets. If that DAO, like most DAOs, are venture-based or have a venture component, that limit of participants goes down to 99. How many DAOs are limited to 99 people, like actual DAOs, like Constitution DAOs? How many members are of that DAO? It's it just doesn't work. So basically, the answer to these clients is, hey, I hate to say this as an American, but you can't do this in America. You have to go offshore. You have to use these certain special uh, vehicles. And unfortunately, they're not cheap. But they do the job of protecting you from 100% general liability and from some very weird tax consequences. Yeah, and I think maybe we'll go into the structures a bit, but I, I think something that comes up now for a lot of you probably is this sounds expensive. I just have this idea that I don't even know will work out. So, like, what's a way to have this, like, minimal viable test of will I go to jail if I do this? And, like, what's the, the entity legal entity structure that I need to do to provide, like, the minimal... Of the, amount of security and privacy for me as a founder, what, what do you talk, how should a founder think through this? So there's a tendency for like any specific service provider to say that they are the most important service provider. So I recognize that. But honestly, talk to a lawyer who knows Web3. Before you start a company, before you enter an accelerator, spend a couple of bucks, have a consult with them, ask them, lay out their project, and like say, do you see any problems with this? They're probably going to say yes. 
They might not, but they're probably going to say yes. And then ask them, well, how can we minimize them? And they might say, there is no way to minimize them. Or they might say, hey, here's how we'll do it, X, Y, Z. You'll have some degree of risk, but this is the most safe way to do it. And that conversation, depending on if you're in New York, San Francisco, it's going to cost you about $1,000. If you were to come talk to me, it cost you about 600 bucks. Uh, it'll be the most, the best spent money that you have ever, ever spent in your entire career as a founder because you will avoid so many pitfalls that will cost you more money to try to fix, to have like a little bit of a, of a legal roadmap at the beginning. It's, I, I, I'm trying to make it not sound self-serving because I don't want it to. I'm sad that this is the state of the industry that we're in, but you have to do it. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add to that, so agree. You know, a couple thousand bucks, it saves you a lot of headache later, but uh, there are other options, but just keep in mind that a legal representative does it by a legal way, uh, but like you could also talk to an advisor, talk to other founders in the space, ask what they have been doing in terms of structuring, and then you kind of have a little bit more of a like um, directed conversation with your lawyer and li limit your legal fees, but in terms of like the broad, is this illegal, I'm gonna go to jail, <laughs> probably direct those at the lawyer, but in terms of structuring best practices and things like that, um, you can go advisory route, you can talk to friends, other founders in the space, uh, incubators, ad accelerators, those are all good methods to kind of get a lay of the land if you're completely clueless on the process. But always prioritize your, your lawyer's uh, insight over your advisor's insight, your investor's insight. Your lawyer has a duty to you. Your lawyer has a malpractice insurance. Your lawyer has to be acting in your best interest. Those other things, they might align, maybe but they may not align perfectly, and you're gonna be the one shouldering that risk. But, like, just to give credit where credit's due, I mean, like, this is a perfect example of somebody who took my advice, good legal advice, and has done it successfully, like, repeatedly. So it's doable, and, you know, belly aches on costs every once in a while, and he's my best friend, but, uh, you know, it, it's been worth its weight in gold. We're up here talking to you. Yeah, definitely, and I do belly <laughs> It's part of it, I guess. Um, let's, let's, uh, and, and, and again, the caveat of that this is not legal advice, but, um, giving founders like some best practices, you hear all these different structures. It should be Marshall Islands. It should be Panamanian Cayman Foundation Co. Like, um, w give us kind of the lay of the land of like best practices for companies, oper organizations operating in web three, perhaps launching a token, some things to keep in mind. Again, not legal advice, but just kind of general, general uh, input. Never launch a token from a U.S. company, ever. Do not do it. Um, do not issue a token warrant from a U.S. company. I know that's kind of the sort of like rage right now. Do not do it because the way that you need to do it is you need to have a structure offshore, ideally a Cayman Foundation company that owns a Cayman exempted company that owns a BVI business company. The BVI company issues the token. Foundation company has no owners. Uh, that's kind of the model for token issuance. It also works really, really well to corporatize a DAO. Um, that'll be your token issuance vehicle. It's becoming standardized. Like we were one of the first firms to adopt it. We're a small firm. I'm very proud of that fact, but it works. But other big firms that want to keep their fees onshore, they'll be like, oh, we got to draft you a token warrant for that entity offshore. So what you're doing, you're saying, hey, I'm an American company and I'm selling securities for an offshore vehicle. That's illegal. That's a, you're violating promoter laws. Don't do it. There are ways around that. Um, I, I think the one thing that you took away, one of the one of the things you took away from this this conversation, do not issue a token onshore. Do not use a token warrant from the offshore vehicle. If you issue a token warrant from the offshore vehicle, you choose to do that. Nothing wrong with that, um, as long as you're following reg S, which means no U.S. investors, and we can go into that. But um, those two things: don't issue a token from the United States. Don't issue a token warrant from the United States company. Yeah, so as, as the token warrant thing, I mean, I do a lot of investing, see this a lot. So people are still making this. What should they do instead? It should be a token side letter. Like, what's the best practices there? The absolute best practice is to have enough money to start the, if you're going to have a token, is to have enough money to start that token structure, which is expensive, from the get-go and do all the token raises from there, from a SAF, from a TPA, token purchase agreement, I understand that that is prohibitive. That, that, you know, the, that entity structure I described costs about 12 grand. Uh, 
C Corp in Delaware or Wyoming costs about 100 bucks. I understand that. So if you can't go straight offshore for your token, well, you got to do something in the middle. A safe and a side letter is kind of a good idea. Um, for the, uh, but as soon as you have enough money for runway to, to move to the offshore, like basically the message is do as little bit of that running, raising onshore through the US entity that probably has a safe note attached to it, probably has a side letter. Get the minimum amount of money to the door to get your runway and get your offshore vehicles structured. And then any future equity raises that you want to do, do on your, the US side. And any future token sales that you want to do, do from the, to from the uh, offshore side. And like, investor gives you a thousand bucks and they want token and equity. Give them a safe in the US, give them a saft in the offshore. Yes, there are that, that, that initial way that I described kind of links the two with the safe in the onshore and the, the side letter to uh, sort of seed everything to get offshore. You want to do that as, for as short a time as possible. It is the, one of the most sketchy parts of this. And there's a, there's a case, uh, the Telegram case, which you, know, you should all read it. It's, it should be required reading for founders in this space. And yeah, it's full of technical jargon, but like, there's a reason why you should do it this way. And it's all based on the very little case law that we have on this nascent industry. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, I'll plug my talk on Friday. If you are fundraising, that's a whole nother conversation. I'm doing a whole talk on it on Friday, like taking your, your company from idea to actually raising funds. This is also super important, kind of beyond the scope of this conversation, but like thinking through those things, as well as all the legal ramifications. Um, do we want to do questions? We've got five minutes. Well, I, one other thing I would add is that like, everybody's afraid of the SEC, the CFTC, FinCEN, the plaintiff's bar is only marginally less scary. For those of you who don't know what that is, that is the legion of plaintiff side attorneys that bring class actions against companies for violating laws. It's a private right of recovery. It's not a criminal thing. Um, but NBA top shots, baseball cards on the internet, or basketball cards on the internet, uh, plaintiff's bar says it's securities. That's not, the, that's not the SEC saying that. That's a plaintiff's attorney saying that. And they don't really care about winning. They care about extracting a gigantic settlement. And that great gigantic settlement could just destroy your entire treasury, uh, force you out of business. Um, they're not looking to set precedent the way the SEC would. They're not looking to put you in jail. They're looking to extract max pain in the form of dollars from you and your company. And they are motivated. And they are resourceful. And they are in every industry in the United States, no matter what you are doing, building cars, medical devices, CBD, marijuana, crypto. And so uh, one of the things that I tell people who come to the firm is, yes, the regulators are the most scary thing. You need to pay attention to them. But you also have to realize that the plaintiff's bar is also coming for you, and the standard of proof that they have to prove is way less than what an actual governmental agency has to prove. So, so all this sounds terrifying, but just make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's, still build cool things, still innovate, still focus on building something that customers want to use, but you know, have it a healthy dose of uh, caution on some of these things. Do you want to do a couple questions? Yeah. We, we have a few minutes. Maybe if uh, anybody has a question, just raise your hand and there's a mic runner over there. Thanks. Um, just for my own education, with regards to the Howey test, do you feel that even if you th like you think that the SEC is not gonna um, how should I say this not gonna put so much stock in even if your company fulfills you know doesn't ha what is it called like fails all the legs of the Howey test, um, they're still gonna try to come after you and and you know, run you out of business or something like that? I mean, again, we can't possibly give a, a wide brush on this, but like Gary Gensler has said that. He has said, other than Bitcoin, you have a team that is, that is working on a project and that token is going to increase in value because of their work. I'm coming to get you. Like that was just published like last week. He straight up said that. Yeah. And <laughs> we got one more minute. It's probably the last question. Yeah, I'd say Howie test is just one thing too. The plaintiffs is is also very very terrifying. So even if you don't, Howie test isn't an issue, and you have like this plaintiffs thing. Max Payne. Uh, my question is: Are you guys also helping to manage like pre-token issuance appraisals for tax purposes? Uh, 
We don't do valuation at the firm, um, but we do have uh, two tax attorneys who spend all their time focusing on the tax consequences of this stuff, which is like a whole other conversation and is also mind-bogglingly un unfair. Are, the, are they publishing anything? Anywhere to read their We their don't research? have time to publish. We are too busy. We, 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 we have too many clients, and we are working like one-armed paper hangers. Cool. So I think that was it for questions. So I, I mean, my takeaway, Dave scares the crap out of people. That's kind of what he does as a lawyer. I'm and also that's what he, a huge I, bull in this space. Yeah, he's actually also wearing a, a, a shirt about tornado cash, so clearly a, a proponent for decentralization and what we're doing here. But like I said before, just maybe don't move fast and break things. Still focus on creating a product that users love and care about. But, um, you know, Dot your I's and cross your T's up, uh, up front. Maybe spend a couple couple dollars on illegal fees. Get an advisor that knows what they're talking about. Hire a lawyer. It doesn't have to be Dave. Dave's a, a, a founder, so he can understand the founder mindset, especially like me, pinching pennies and stuff like that. Uh, you know, he, he knows as a founder. It doesn't have to be Dave, but get get a lawyer on your team early early on to help you out with this stuff. I guess that's my takeaway. Yeah, I mean, that's my takeaway. is It doesn't have to be us. But um, talk to a savvy Web3 lawyer. And if you have the chance, talk to a savvy Web3 lawyer who built their firm from nothing um, because they'll have the same understandings of running a business and founding a company that you do. So thanks, everybody. Cheers, guys. Thanks.